so welcome today to our new knowledge. Um, my name is Kathy Lowe, and we are, are happy to see so many faces in the crowd. One of our favorite uh, technology people is going to speak to us today about cybersecurity. He uh, is the Information Technology Director for the Town of Abingdon and is my guru from way back. So we we are happy to have Floyd today, and I think he's going to give you a presentation, and then he's going to give you an opportunity for question and answer. Floyd Bay. Thank you. Y'all ready to have some fun? I hope everybody ate. I don't try not to make you sick. I talking about <laughs> technology. Sometimes technology makes us sick. Well, it makes me sick. I don't know about you. Let's do something first. I'd like to know who I got in the audience, and I know I have several technology people, um, and that's good. I'm glad you're here, and um, in fact, I, I may solicit your assistance through this process of discussion. And I know we have, so we have a varied audience, but if we can go around the room, maybe start here, tell me who you are, and what brought you here, who you work for, if that's what's driving it, if you have specific concerns. Uh, my name's Bill Coppage, I'm the infrastructure engineer for Spamco, and so I'm here because we saw the flyer hanging up on the board. Okay. Infrastructure engineer, where are y'all located? In this building. Yeah. Right here in this building. Okay, cool. Hi, I'm Stephanie Surrey, I'm the director of the Spam Center of Excellence. Um, we're a nonprofit organization um, under the Southwest Virginia Alliance for Manufacturing to support rural manufacturing in the region. Um, and one of the reasons, and we're actually starting to offer some IT managed services to the small and manufacturers in the region, uh, helping them move to toward their DFARS, DFARS compliance so they can do contracting with federal government and larger manufacturers. And there's a shortage of qualified, competent, reliable, and cost effective IT people in the region. So we're going to try to help our manufacturers get up to what they need to be. Very good. Hi, I'm Valerie Caldell, Facilities of, um, Director of Facilities and Support Services for People Incorporated, which encompasses our IT department. Okay. I'm Maria Crosswhite, I'm Desktop Support Specialist at People Incorporated. And I'm Stephen Tate, I'm also with People Incorporated, I am the uh, IT supervisor. Okay, cool. Lots of IT people. I'm Kyle Craig, I have a small company here in Abingdon called Computer Solutions. Just always trying to learn more stuff to help my customers. Sure. Very good. Especially Bowen, I think you're the one. All right. <laughs> Just for the fun of it. Yes, sir. Good. Good opportunity. And I'm Melba Bowen. Same thing. All right. Very good. Anita Farmer, the Executive Vice President of the Washington State Chamber of Commerce, as always. Much fun to have you. Well, thank you. I'm glad to be here. Glad, glad to be a part. much as we struggle with it, um, sometimes it's, it's like this, there's, there's disadvantages to the security that we implement because it causes people to have to, to work within a framework that's often uncomfortable. A locking doors, you know, I went out to the restroom and I couldn't come back in this way. And because I couldn't come back in, I was like, <laughs> And so I had to walk all the way around. And you know, IT is like that. Every day I'm locking things down and people are calling me up and saying, quit locking our stuff down. And I'm like, well, do you want to be safer, don't you? I mean, I don't say that, but that's the, that's the thought, you know? It's like, I'm sorry, you know? Since 9-11, we go to the airport and what do we do now? Stand in line. 
so we can go through and be checked and scanned and touched and looked through so that we can make sure that we're safe in the air. And it's the same way with, with cybersecurity, cybercrime, the internet. So much of, of what we do every day is, uh, is um, really on some type of electronic device. And so it's important. It's an important subject. And really, so this little short hour that we talk today is not going to be um, as much as you probably will want. And I hope, I hope that I can leave you, you hungry to, to kind of get to know more. That you'll say, wow, there's a lot, and I, and I need to know more about that. Sorry, I got a Gmail. Um, I could have turned that off. But he's, this, this, is, this slide tells us a little bit about different type of cyber attacks. And I want you to notice that between 2015, with $400 billion estimated costs worldwide for cybercrime, in 2019, the estimate was $2 trillion. That's a significant, very significant increase of cost in cybercrime. It's, it's every day. And, and to me, it's to some degree very scary. I didn't introduce myself. I'm Floyd Bailey. I'm the Director of Information Technology for the Town of Abingdon. I've been in that position for 12 years. 12 years ago, when I came to work for the town, I will say, of course, we were concerned with firewalls. We were concerned with safety and security and logging in and email and things of that nature, but nothing compared to what we do today. Our budgets have more than tripled uh, just in the area of security making sure that we are safe and secure. Where, where, what we used to, to take for granted, we don't take for granted anymore. Antivirus, you know, is a constant concern. It's something that a lot of times we take for granted even in our own personal devices. Um, it, it, you know, it, it used to be that you weren't so much concerned with uh, particular viruses on your portable devices, but now you're concerned a little bit about, about viruses in your portable devices. Um, this, this is a growing, it's growing exponentially, and it is only going to get worse. And so that's not doomsday, it's realism. Um, the reality is we should pay attention. Malware, phishing is a big thing. We're going to talk a lot about phishing today. That's really the, the heart of what our discussion is going to be about today. Um, because I think it's the, uh, it's the most common for us as individuals. On the IT level, there are a whole lot of other concerns. On the daily user uh, side, really phishing, spelled with a P, not a F, P-H, not a, not a F, um, is what we are watching for. These other types of attacks are very technical in, in their um, manifestation. Um, and they are, but they're still constantly out there. Not something we're going to talk about today, but I just wanted to, you to see sort of the scope of some of the cyber attacks. When we start this discussion, the first thing you got to think about is authentication. Who are you? Because ultimately, that's what security is all about. If you come to the door, and knock on the door and I can't see you through the window, I might say, who are you? And, and you'll tell me something about yourself. You'll tell me your name. You might tell me your position, your authority. Why can't I enter this door? And, uh, and I may choose to open the door and let you in, or I may say, no, you're not allowed in this area. So it's about authentication. That's, that's the facts of life. Um, there's places where we're allowed to be and there's places where we're not allowed to be. So when it comes to uh, technology, there's, there's uh, processes you're allowed to do and there are processes that you're, you shouldn't be allowed to do. Um, especially in your corporate environments, um, locking things down so that everybody doesn't have access to everything is a very important step in the, the technology process of securing your, your network. Um, people don't like it and it gets uncomfortable. I got a call just today, this is, this is very common for me, every, just today, from the visitor center and they said, we keep getting, we started today getting this pop-up from a software we're using 
And uh, it keeps saying, put in your username and password. And I remember the days when I would have said, okay, yeah, go ahead and plug this in. And I'd give them a username and I'd give them a password. And they'd plug it in and it'd be done. That don't happen anymore. Now I either have to remote into their system, elevate their credentials, put in an administrative password so that they can allow the loading of a particular software, first determine that it's something that actually needs to be installed and that it's not some type of malware running. Uh, I, have to, I have to make these assessments before I give them, their computer, the right to open the door. And so um, sometimes um, authentication, that's a part of that. The right person at the right place with the right credential of being able to, to uh, set that basis of trust, identifying who you are. We can do this uh, identification. A lot of people are using biometric technologies for identification. Um, the, the most common, what's the most common? Fingerprinting. Fingerprinting. We use them at the town now for, for clocking in and clocking out. It gets real hard for our guys down at the town shop who's, who've worn their fingerprints off. And uh, we actually have to put a, lo a bottle of lotion next to the clock-in machine so that they can lotion up their hands to try to hydrate their fingerprints so they can actually log in for their day's work and log out at the end of the day. Um, these kinds of things are difficult. There are other types of biometric scans. Does anybody have any experience with any? Face recognition. Face recognition. What uses that now? Your cell phones, and it's quite amazing how well it works. In fact, I have to say I'm highly impressed. Um, this is the XR10, and it sees me in the dark. And I, I'm highly impressed with the technology that allows that it opens without me, it even me trying. But if I'm not here, it forces the, uh, the code, the four digits or six digits, whichever you have set up. So anyway, that is, a, that is a type of biometric. I remember years ago, one of the big things was going to be retinal scan. They do use them in certain high, high sensitive applications and places. I've been in one place in my life. It was the AT&T World Call Center in Atlanta, Georgia, years ago that had a retina scan technology built in. And, but I don't see that very much. Um, there are uh, all kinds of other things they can use, but thankfully we don't use them, like tongue scanning. <laughs> that gets really nasty when you're the third in line, you know. Um, anyway, <laughs> anything like that could potentially be used for, for uh, determining who you are. Then a physical authentication of, of where you are is often used. These are the, these are the basic framework of authentication. Where are you? Well, I'm logging in from our branch office in Atlanta, Georgia, and, uh, but you're not, you don't have authentication rights because you're in Atlanta, Georgia. You know, if you were in Nashville, Tennessee, I'd say yes to you, but you're in Atlanta, Georgia. You don't, you don't belong here. So these kinds of things are, are a part of authentication process. Tokens, does anybody uh, have a bank account that provides them with a, with a token that has a, a, a randomized number that you can utilize to type in and, and access your accounts? I know many accountants. Where did the, our accountant go? No? You don't run into any customers with that? It's uh, a lot of banks even around here will provide that, that technology to ensure that the person logging into their account is an authorized user that they haven't stolen a username and password. And uh, so they'll have these. I know some local businesses have them. I've seen them. I used them years ago. I worked for Gateway Corporation. Don't judge me. Um, we, uh, we used them uh, to, uh, since we were traveling around all over the country and we would log in uh, in the same fashion. Of course, the most common, what you know, what do you have in your head, I know my username and I know my password. Um, and then and now we're a lot in the most common and the high, most highly recommended is a two-factor authentication process. Think about two-factor authentication. That could be any two of these things. 
So, um, uh, anybody anybody experiencing two-factor authentication in your everyday life? Yes. I think you all are. Anybody have a Google account that asked you to uh, let me send you a code to your cell phone? Type that code in. That's two-factor authentication. You've typed in your name, you've typed in your password, and then it sends you a, a, a text, and you've got to have this phone in your hand so that you can include that number. That's all for security. The whole purpose is to allow and make sure that somebody out there hasn't somehow figured out what your username and password is and that they haven't hacked your account. Okay. Y'all feel free to uh, throw something at me if you, if you want to say something or ask any questions, especially any questions and uh, anything you want to add. Who knows anything about ransomware? It's in the news. I know you hear about it. What do you know? Anybody been hit by it? Yeah. Yeah, in the last two months, I know of three local organizations. I know of three. Four? We were hit last week. Okay. And you know, uh, the most frustrating thing about it is, is that um, the whole basis of a ransomware attack is that they're using our own really great technology against us. <laughs> um, we, we uh, developed encryption techniques to hide data from people so that people couldn't get your information. And now, because hackers are so good at, at their craft, and they are, and they're so lasered in on certain organizations, and it has been so successful that people have to have their data back, that they can take your data and using our technology, our great encryption technology, encrypt your data so tight that it would take 75, 150, 200 years for the fastest computers on earth to break the encryption to get your data back unless you have that key that they give you. It's just like the key to the door. And so what's interesting about that, come on in. What's, what's interesting about that is, is that um, most of those hackers that are um, launching ransomware attacks, they're very, uh, they're very diligent about ensuring that the people who get hit with their ransomware encryption of all their data, when they pay, get their keys back. They don't want you to lose your data. You know why? Because next time you'll say, you know what, we paid last time and it just wasn't worth paying, so we're not going to pay next time. So what have they got? They've got us over a barrel. It's like, we pay them, so they keep hacking and attacking. If, if we stopped paying them, they would be like, oh man, this is a waste of time. They're not going to pay us. But then we got the problem that we lose our data. So it's not, it's not uh, reasonable for us to lose our data always. But the whole goal is to prevent these kinds of attacks in the first place. And, uh, and that requires diligence on our part. Constant and continual diligence. Because really, and the reason this comes up front is most ransomware attacks begin through an email exchange. An exchange of information through emails. And we don't even realize we're doing it. We think we're just doing business. We think we're being responsible because I open every email that comes into my mailbox. And I read it for information and I determine whether it's good and I click on the links and I look at stuff and if I don't like it, I delete it. And we don't realize that in that process, we are hanging ourselves out to dry. So what we've got to do is we've got to begin teaching in an environment such as this people to say, you know what, I don't recognize that. Trash, 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 trash. This is garbage, this is garbage. I don't want it. Thank you, no thank you. <laughs> Ultimately, don't open, don't read, don't click, don't touch. Get rid of, 
the emails that are coming into your system. Because as diligent as we are, and I will say this, and I believe it with all my heart, we have at the town of Abingdon the best money can buy when it comes to uh, spam detection, email spam detection. But guess what? Every day, all my users are still getting spam because they know how to pass the spam detectors and get into your inbox and even to look like they are somebody you know, uh, that you trust, and that you, or that you would be interested in. And so um, it's important for us to learn some of these techniques to, to, to try to defend ourselves. Uh, quickly, ransomware attacks occur when hijackers hijack your computer system, your website, they demand payment. Um, government agencies, hospitals, schools, um, this year only, this is in 2019, this year alone there's a documented 621 cyber attacks and I truly think this number was created last month and I think it's probably wrong because it, it seems like it's getting worse and not better. There's a map of, uh, of mapped uh, ransomware attacks, big ones. I know there's a whole lot more than that. So it, so it boils down to phishing and uh, this don't get hooked. And I'll tell you, um, I, I borrowed a lot of this, um, the, uh, a lot of this uh, PowerPoint from offline where somebody else had built it. So we're going to go through this at the uh, uh, North Dakota University, I think, put together a lot of the material in this. So I give them credit. Um, and we're just going to talk about it and make some personal applications um, and see if we can't come up with some ways to help ourselves to overcome this threat. So phishing. What is phishing? Um, you notice they're designed to trick you into clicking a link or providing personal or financial information. It's in the form of emails, and they are websites that you visit. It may appear to come from a legitimate company, an organization, something or someone that you know. They take advantage of certain events, current events going on, like natural disasters, epidemics, health scares, elections, other timely events, things that uh, you may say, wow, that's interesting, I think I'll read about that. So we see uh, when, when bad things happen in the world, you'll see an uptick in this kind of phishing uh, campaigns. There are uh, mass phishing attacks which are designed to attack large uh, masses of people all at once. And uh, that's where they're seeking to see who they can get on the hook to narrow down. Um, and so these come from uh, uh, to, to large email caches of addresses where they can get as many email addresses together as they can find or gather or garner or steal, whatever, they will, uh, will send out uh, more attacks. Uh, the spear phishing concept is where they're picking on somebody, an individual or a company. They say, you know what, this person's got on my nerves or these people have a lot of money. And, or I hear, I hear that this, this group has a really good insurance policy. Um, that's one thing that always bothers me when it gets published in the newspaper when there's a ransomware attack that they say, well, we have an insurance policy that covers that. Oh, great. Tell, tell the whole world, why don't you? <laughs> you know, <clears throat> it's, uh, it's just going to embolden them. Um, whaling is uh, the concept term they use to describe where they're going to pick on somebody big. Like remember years ago, uh, Sarah Palin, uh, her Gmail account was hacked by, a, I think it was like a 15-year-old boy. Um, but this happens all the time. The CEO of the corporation, the mayor of the town, um, they, they pick on titles, people that they think, you know, will give them access because they might have administrative rights. Um, clone phishing is a way of creating a document where it looks like something that you've already received or are familiar with. 
And so if they are able to get their hands on, uh, there's so much data on the internet anymore and, and you can find emails that have been sent even recently that have been scanned in as PDFs and documents and, and government records because of the Freedom of Information Act and the posting of information online where you go in and you see all this data and you see, oh look, there was an email sent by this person last week. They copy that email out, reproduce it, and then put in their nefarious links, um, send it out from their own servers and get a response from, from the person who's thinking, oh, this is from the CEO of the corporation. I just talked to him last week about this matter. And uh, he's asking another question, following up, whatever. Um, those kinds of things. Um, advanced fee scams are where they actually say we're going to hurt you if you don't pay. And uh, you don't see that as much, but it's still, it is out there. Um, thing that I have seen, I've actually seen every single one of these, every one of these, in the town of Abingdon, in the last six months, in emails we have received. So, we get emails that say, this is from the IT department. This is from the help desk. And I need you to um, follow a certain course of action. There's issues with your email account. Your storage limit is uh, at its peak. Um, you need to contact the, email, contact the IT department by clicking on this link. Um, usually, it's in the attempt to be as... Uh, helpful as possible that people get caught because they think oh that IT department they're so nice look they just gave me a link all I got to do is click here and ultimately what happens is, is you're, you're caught by the hook um, advertisements for uh, weight loss hair growth fitness on and on and on and on it goes all kinds of products um, and, and we're going to talk about this after I get through this list. Invoices and shipping orders. I get them. I got, I got some last month. I think I got three in a row from the same uh, fake a uh, email address um, that appeared to be legitimate. And I'll talk to you about how you figure that out here in a minute. But it appeared to be legit. Um, it simply said invoice. To pay your invoice, click here or to view your invoice, open this attachment. And um, if, you op if you go to open an attachment and it doesn't open, you have a reason to be concerned. Um, if you click on a link and it goes nowhere, you have a reason to be concerned. Going nowhere does not mean safety. Going nowhere potentially means that what you just did was clicked on and gave permission to their software to load in the background of your system, which could be key logging, which is the concept of well, every time I type something on my keyboard, it's keeping a record and, and, and caching that out to the hacker at night. And all he does is he takes all that mass of stuff you type today and he looks and sees, that looks like a password and look at there, there's a username and a password right next to each other. Because it gives him all these letters and numbers and everything you've typed and you know you can read it like a letter and then you get to this place where it says Snoopy Dog 1 and then right after that look at there there's, there's the password so um, those kinds of things happen it's very common it's one of the there's other ways but that's one of the most common then you get notifications from a credit card company telling you that there's been an unauthorized transaction on your bank account or on your credit card you think, wow, this is from Citibank, and you click on it, and you, or you open it, and again, uh, it may say to you, uh, put your password in here, put your username in here, and you think, well, I log on to this on my, on, I log on to Citibank, and all they did was give me the log on page. So you're just, like you're logging on, and guess what you just did? You gave your username and your password through an email to the hacker who spoofed you an email and you, you've, uh, you've given away your information. So 
um, there's ways to help with that, and we'll talk about that too. Um, bank accounts on social media. Anybody ever had somebody um, send you a social media message that says, hey, haven't talked to you in a long time. And you look at it and think, well, that's weird. You're right, I haven't talked to you in a long time. In fact, I probably never talked to you. <laughs> but it's just one of those short little, well, guess what they're trying to do? They're trying to get you to engage them into a conversation so that they can exploit you and hack into your social media account. And ultimately, uh, because they've taken over your friend's account, now they're going to take over your account, and they're going to take all over all your friend's accounts. And a lot of that's about information gathering. A lot of it's about um, the ego of the hacker, because you know they may think, wow, look at what I've done. Um, they may or may not be able to make money off of it, or they can sell information that they've gathered together, and they do. So. Uh, these kinds of things happen very commonly. Um, so here's, a, here's an example of a claim from a, from a help, help desk. Um, and you notice it says, your mailbox has exceeded its storage limit. Does anybody get these? You get them? Okay. I know the town gets them. We send them. Uh, Exchange sends them. Um, I don't know. Um, typically... Um, but you notice what it says here. Since your mailbox has exceeded its storage limit, you will not be able to receive new email until you revalidate it. Click here. One of the ways to know um, if this is a legitimate um, hyperlink or not is called the mouse over. And when you take your, when you take your mouse, and you, put, you don't click on it, but you put your mouse uh, arrow over it, it will pop up above it what that link is going to. Um, you can also right click and go into its properties and see where, the, where, where is this going? Where does this link go? And, and, and if it looks suspicious or weird, um, first of all, it would always be safe to say, if you get an email like this, call your IT person. Um, anything of this nature that's, that's prompting you to an action through a link in the email. And I don't care if it's, if it's telling you that, that you, know, you can't send email or, anymore or if it says your credit card is being canceled or if it says your social security card has been locked or if it says you know, anything. I don't care what it says. If it's prompting you to an action with a link in the email, First, validate it. And the process of validation would be making a phone call, uh, not responding to the email, okay? Not responding to the email. And I, and I hope I can in, burn that into your minds. Do not respond to the email. Let me give you an example. And this, again, is not because I'm picking on anybody at the town. The, the person who did this, um, ha I have a good working relationship with her, and she fully understands now the seriousness. Uh, one of our employees got an email that said, uh, that portended to be from another one of our, uh, our uh, employees. And this person said, hey, I have changed my bank account. Please fix my paycheck to go to my new account Here's my numbers. Okay, so the first time this happened, she printed it out. This happened multiple times, okay? The first time, she printed out the email. She pulled the form necessary to change the information. She went into the accounting system and changed the information to the new bank account. She filled out the form that needed to be signed by the employee. And the day before the paychecks were going out, she just happened, by the grace of God, to see him in the hallway. And she said, hey, you need to sign this form. And he's like, for what? She said, for your payroll change. I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, well, I got an email from you. See? Had his name at the top. He's like, I didn't send you that. That's not my account. She's like, oh no. 
So she goes in immediately, thankfully, within the nick of time, changes it back to his proper bank account information, stops everything. So we have a discussion and we say, listen, whenever you get information like this, you need to verify it first. This is, this is uh, important that you verify. Well, I didn't go far enough, I guess, in the discussion of what it means to verify because a few weeks later, they thought they had a fish on the hook because actually she had responded back and said, okay, I'll take care of it in the, her response. That's all she said. I'll take care of it. Well, they thought, well, we got a fish on the hook now. We're going to try her again. So they picked another employee. And it was about a month later, sent another email. She thinks this time, aha, this may not be legit. I'll find out if it's legit. She writes him back. I need to verify that this is you. And, um, <laughs> and please. And so she has a three or four email conversation with this hacker about who he is. And she becomes satisfied that it is actually the employee of the town. And, um, but before she actually changes it, she calls me. She says, Floyd, I verified this person, but I'm still feeling a little weird, and I, I just need you to check it. So I go into our uh, archiver. I pull up the email that came in. I go in. I mouse over the address. I find out it has, it's a Gmail address. It's not, wasn't even a Gmail address. It was, wasn't even a Yahoo address. It was some foreign address. And I was like, uh, no, this is not real. And you've had a nice four email conversation with this person overseas. They think they got you over on the hook and that you're going to just work with them. I said, you got to stop. <laughs> you got to stop. Don't click and, and reply. Don't talk back to, in these kinds of situations. If somebody sends you an invoice and you're not expecting an invoice, if you didn't know that XYZ Corporation was sending you an invoice and it comes in, it says XYZ Corporation invoice, what do you do? Delete it. If you think, well, there's an outside possibility that XYZ Corporation was sending, they would send another one. Amen to that. If you really, really, really felt like, I just got to find out, then you pick up the telephone and you call XYZ Corporation and say, hey, I received an invoice from you. Is it legit? And you know what they might say to you? No, we've been hacked. <laughs> and so that's very important. Very, very important. Not to respond. Do not reply. Um, Mouse over stuff to see what's in the background to find out if it's, if it's actually some, some, one of your, your own people. Um, HR, big, big uh, here's, here's something that happened to our HR department. Um, the HR uh, director received an email from the mayor. And, uh, and the mayor said, I need you to go and buy five gift cards to give away. I'm going to a meeting. I'm really busy. Please take care of this right away. And then, so she was like, okay, that's something weird. She calls me, thankfully. I say, yes, that's real weird. Don't go buy any gift cards. <laughs> Do not go buy any gift cards. Don't ever go buy any gift cards. I don't care if the President of the United States calls you and says, buy gift cards, do not go buy gift cards. And more than that, do not scratch off the back and put the numbers <laughs> in the email. Um, that's what they typically want you to do. They want you to give them the numbers because they have a card printer and they use those numbers to print their own cards. And you've bought the gift card and now they have it in their hand and they go cash it before you even have a chance to, to get down to the store. Um, Happens all the time, very common. Uh, claims to be from, from places that are legitimate, that you, like, like companies, like PayPal, um, is a big one. Um, Highland Union Bank recently, I think it happened a few years ago, several years ago. Um, we've had several from other local banks where an email comes in, and I described it to you a few moments ago, where the email says, there's problems with your account, please log in. This is a security check. 
write your name in this box, your username in this box, put your, and they oftentimes will ask for even more information, like your social security number, your driver's license number. They basically steal your identity by um, posing to be somebody that you think is legitimate. They're local. It, the, it, you may even bank there. But um, you're not going to receive an email ever from your banking institution or your credit card institution telling you to log in on the email that they send you. You just won't, it, it don't come that way. They would never do that. And, and they would never, never, never um, in a million years ask you to, uh, to tell them what your username or password is. If somebody ever says to you on a phone call, if they've called you up and says, tell me your username and password, I don't care if it's your director of IT in your company. He's testing you. <laughs> he's, he's testing you. And if he is doing it, you need to say, look, we really need to stop doing that. Um, listen, 12 years ago, yeah, we did it all the time. We did it all the time. What's your password? Okay. We don't do it anymore. We don't do it anymore. Um, it's just not a safe way to, to do business. Some of the things you'll always notice in these uh, um, um, emails that you get, these phishing scams, is that there's lots of spelling errors, lacking punctuation, poor grammar. You see that all the time. You see hyperlinks or URLs that differ, and that's or it's hidden, and you can't see. It looks like it comes from this address, but when you mouse over it, it gives you a different address. It's trash. It's trash. It's always trash. I don't care. Even if it's somebody legit trying to send it to you, you think it's legit, trash it. It's not worth taking the risk. If it has threatening language, calls you to action immediately, it requests you for any personal information, personally identifiable information in any email, anytime it's ever requested, or even over the phone, these phishing scams, one of the uh, one of the the biggest methods of of uh, of, of hacking is um, social engineering. It's it's the first level of hacking, social engineering. Let me tell you what that is. Um, I call you on the phone, and I say, "Hey, I, um, this is Floyd Bailey. I'm the IT person for your corporation, and uh, the CEO." Jack Robinson, you know him, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, I know Jack. Well, he told me to give you a call. Um, he, he said that um, there had been some issues that he wanted me to address, and I need to get access to your machine. Um, I need to remote in to your machine. Um, so if you wouldn't mind, go to XYZ website and give me the information, the, the login credentials, and I'll, I'll log into your machine. So then I remote into your machine. And I say, you know, this is going to take me 10 or 15 minutes, so uh, you don't have to sit there and watch me if you don't want to, but you, you just do whatever you want, and I'll talk to you later. And then I hang up, and I'm remoted into your machine. Then I can do anything I want to do. I can install uh, tra tracking devices on your machine. I can install uh, uh, nefarious um, software do whatever I want to. I can pull down data. I can pull down files. If you've got, if you've got secret company documents, I can pull them down. And, and you may be sitting there thinking, well, the CEO told him to call. But all I did was tell you that. That don't mean the CEO told me to call. And that's what we got to get used to in our world is that people don't tell the truth. They lie constantly. And so, um, it's, it's even more than that. Um, there's what's called penetration testing, and, and there are corporations around here that do that kind of work. Um, I'm not a pen tester. Um, but the, one of the things that they do is um, um, they'll send one of their employees when they're doing penetration testing who will drive up to your safe facility, park in your parking lot, sit in the car and wait for two or three employees who are coming to work that morning. They get out of their car and kind of meander up behind them as they're going in the door. Swipe the card, open the door, two people go in. 
swipe the card, open the door. Three people go in, and one of them's the pen tester. He doesn't belong there. He doesn't even work there. But they don't know that. They just think, well, I don't know where he is. But hey, come on in. <laughs> he goes in. He goes uh, up to one of the to the desks, and he says to the receptionist, you know, I'm... I'm with XYZ Copiers, your copier, I have a report that your copier's having problems. And so they go over to the copier and they know the, the codes, which you typically on most copiers are always the default username and password. And then they go in and they print off the uh, network information, they gather some information. They go around to somebody else's office and they say, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm here picking up trash. And they pick up your trash can and they take out the bag and then they go out to their car. They gather information, anything they can find. Anywhere they see, there could be a, a piece of information. And they search through the trash. They do dumpster diving. They do all kinds of things. If they want to get into your organization, this reason shredding is extremely important uh, in our world today. But... This kinds of information, these kinds of information will give people uh, access into your network. And, um, and so it's important to realize that uh, just be it's not always through an email. Sometimes the social engineering mechanism will be utilized for people to be phishing you to get information from you on a telephone call, face-to-face -face conversation, and you may say, well, yeah, you know, this is how I log into my machine. And sometimes you just think you're being nice. You're not being nice to yourself. You're being nice to the hacker who's going to take your information and exploit your company or exploit you for your money. Now, these phone calls where people say you're, there's problems on your, on your, your uh, login account, the phone calls you may receive that say, you know, um, please log on to this account, hang up. Don't talk to them, don't do it, don't listen, don't care, not interested. If you think there's something wrong with your computer, take it to one of our local shops. I know these guys came in at G ages, ages. Tell us about your company. We do IT consulting. IT consulting. We deal with this all the time. Right. And, and I guess y'all work with both small businesses and individuals and... Yep. So I saw your website and I liked it. And these are the kind of guys. Any, um, your company, tell me, computer, computer solutions. solutions, right? Computer solutions. Was there another one that I'm overlooking? Give equal time to everyone. Um, these are the kind of people who are there to be your frontline defense for. Um, and, and if you think, uh oh, I clicked on something, nothing happened. I may have a virus now. Don't risk your company's network. Call one of these professionals to come in and scan your system. Call them to, if your antivirus is not up to date, you need to make sure you have good antivirus. Let's, let's, uh, let's move on. So I, Could you detect the phishing scam in this email? It's a Gmail account. But guess what? If you worked for the North Dakota something university, Southern, North Dakota Southern University, I think it is, and you saw that, you may not think anything about it. And, and you notice, you notice the, any other uh, giveaways in this email. They don't give you a phone number to call for verification. It's a good one. It requires immediate action. It's asking you to do something right now. That is, click this link to change your password. It's misspelled password. Um, see, all of these are, are giveaways that thankfully we have. Um, <clears throat> in, in this email, but the number one thing to do, because it's so easy, listen, it's so easy. It's easy even for me 
and I talk about this stuff all the time, it's really easy for me to say, oh, click. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> and then I'm ticked. So uh, this is, don't feel stupid. That's, that's, that's the enemy's advantage, is making us feel stupid. You're not stupid if you click on the wrong thing. You're just normal. It's really, that's all it is. You're just normal. And, and you trust people. It's actually a, the reality of trust that you think, oh, well, thank you for letting me know, click. Oh, no, now I'm ticked. So ultimately, um, that's, that's, a, that's a good example. How about uh, uh, this one you notice? The name, and, the, and there is the, all the things that we just noticed. Um, that you, you, should, you should be willing to catch or ready to catch. Um, this, is a, this is a login page. Um, and what do you notice about this one? Am I in your way? They're circled. Misspelled words. Who is this webmaster administrator asking me to do something? This is a web page. I mean, this is crazy stuff. But you know, the interest. The funny thing is, we do phishing campaigns um, to for our employees at the town of Abingdon, and uh, these phishing campaigns are designed to try to trick them, so that we can. Um, what happens is, is when they do the wrong thing. That it then scrolls up and says, you've been caught. Um, please click here to view this video. <laughs> and so they will view the video. And, uh, of course, it tells them this is the IT department. Please call Floyd Bailey if you have any questions. And we give them all the verification information. But the whole goal is to teach people to stop clicking, stop filling out forms, stop answering questions, stop telling people the information that they're asking for, uh, unless there is serious uh, verification and knowledge of, of what's going on. Um, do you know who the sender is um, here? Um, do you ha notice that there's no greeting at the top, no salutation, no signature? They're asking you to um, get an attachment, download an attachment. Stay away from them. Just don't do it. Stay away from them. Delete them. Um, stop, think, connect. Before you click, look for the baiting tactics. Um, if the message looks suspicious, too good to be true, treat it as if it is. If it says you just want a $50 gift card to, um, to Chick-fil-A, or even less than that, let's just say a free chicken sandwich, click here. How many people would fall for that? We did that exact one. We did the free Chick-fil-A sandwich. And uh, the thing that was interesting is we, out of all of our employees, our users, 150 users, we caught three. And uh, one of them said, as soon as I clicked it, I hit myself in the head. Because <laughs> I was like, oh, can't believe I clicked that. And, you know, and it popped up, then you've been caught. And so... But the point is, we're trying to teach them to stop. Make sure you have good antivirus on your electronic devices. Here are some examples. I, I don't sell antivirus. I don't care what you buy. I do have, I mean, I, I'm sort of out of the loop on what's the best out there nowadays. Um, so I would refer to these guys to give you suggestions in that regard. But... I mean, Norton's been around forever, McAfee's been around forever, Kapersky's been around forever. We use a, a product called Sophos at the town of Abingdon, um, but um, there's AVG, there's the free version of AVG. One thing you want to make sure with regard to antivirus, and again, if you need help with this to ensure that you are well protected, you need to make sure you don't end up loading two or three versions of an antivirus on your machine. You will cause yourself no end of heartache, frustration, and aggravation thinking that your machine needs to be thrown in the trash because you've got antivirus fighting with each other. 
And so you need to make sure you don't do that. So the best way to do that is, again, to have somebody, who, an IT person, to take care of that for you. If you don't have one, that's what these companies are for, and they can help you in that regard. Um, use spam filters to help reduce the malicious, malicious traffic that you might be receiving. Um, Gmail does some spam filtering. Of course, Office 365 does some spam filtering. Um, there's all kinds of online versions of spam filtering. Um, at the town, we use a device-based, it's cloud, but device-based uh, um, Barracuda spam filter. Um, there's all different kinds. Something is better than nothing, and, uh, and it will help you to, to pull some of that out. But, but the what about taking from like webmail, some of your servers, if you have webmail, does that help? Because the main webmail services They do. Most of your webmail services have some spam filtering built into them. So depending upon which webmail service you're using, um, you need to make sure that your spam uh, filters are properly um, set up. So um, that would vary, but that is, if you have Gmail or Yahoo or, God forbid, AOL, <laughs> there's still some AOL addresses out there. My mother has one. Um, CenturyLink, um, it's not BBU anymore, it's um, Point Broadband. They'll do Xfinity, they do spam filtering. And you can talk to them about their spam. And so many of them do spam filtering anyway, but you need to make sure that the spam filters are set up properly so that you um, are. And then you need to check your spam mailboxes. And may I, may I strongly recommend that you go into your email, look for your spam mailbox, and delete it, all the information out of it. Delete all of the junk that's in there. Because even if you don't ever go in there and look, you might have 100,000 emails in there that you've never gone in and deleted because your spam filter has moved them into the spam folder and you're just holding junk on your computer. Go in there and delete it. Empty your deleted items folders. Empty them. You don't need to keep 10,000 deleted items. If you deleted it once, you probably aren't going to need it. If you do need it, you can call the person and say, I'm sorry, I deleted that. I, I would rather be in a situation where I deleted something that I needed than to be in a situ situation where I've kept something that's going to harm me because I accidentally open it and click on it. Not paying attention, saying, what in the world is this? Um, whatever. Just, just delete, delete, delete. No, no fear in delete. Um, protect yourself. Refuse the bait. Don't click hyperlinks and emails. Um, notice that um, these, are, these are two variants that I've seen in emails that we've received at the town of Abingdon. You notice they're just simply misspelled hyperlinks. But how easy would that be for somebody that worked for the town to think, oh, that's abingdon.com. Oh, no, it's not. It's not. It's only missing one letter, but it's not. And that's all that it takes to make a different web address hyperlink connection. To, and I, I suspect that, especially with local governments, this is one of the most common ways that uh, some of these ransomware attacks have been uh, orchestrated. Um, people clicking on links in their email, granting access, and um, having flat networks where if I get on your computer and I know I have access to your computer, that means I can talk to your server with your credentials. That means I can look at all your stored files and I can download them, I can erase them, I can lock them with ransomware. Um, and so um, examine them closely. If they say HTTPS at the beginning on a website, that's a, that's a good sign. Um, HTTPS is the Hypertext Transfer Protocol. It's secured. 
it's a secured uh, technology um, and it requires um, security certificates to, uh, to, to ensure that the site is a safe location. The old HTTP sites that are still out there some, uh, and many times in your browser it will tell you at the top that it's an insecure site. But you may not even notice it. You may not even realize it, but you're in an insecure site. But look for these kinds of, of things if you, if you can keep this in your mind. Have, uh, if you suspect you've been fished, the very first thing you need to do um, as, as uh, the, one of the guys that um, I just hired for the town of Abingdon, he came from Best Buy. He's been with, uh, he was in here a few minutes ago when he brought me this cable. Um, he said that um, people would call him on the phone and, and say, talking to the Geek Squad, and uh, I think I've been hacked. And they'd say, well, cut your hard line. And there, this, he, this guy says, cut your hard line. What does that mean? I don't know. Cut your hard line. And so um, here's the simple reality of technology is that it's all about connectivity. Connectivity facilitates our problems. So, yeah, if you think you've been hacked, unplug your router. If you're wireless, shut it all down. Turn it all off. Call your IT professional at that point, but turn everything off. Don't leave your computer sitting there for three days while you get somebody out to look at it. Because if you have been hacked and they are looking at your system overnight, by the time the IT guy gets there, it may be fully locked up in ransomware and there's nothing you can do but either pay the money or buy a new computer. So the truth of the matter is, um, because to fix it's actually more expensive than buying a new computer, not because it couldn't be fixed, but you won't get your data back. Um, so that's, that's always the first thing. The first thing is disconnect. Turn it off. Shut it down. Um, they can't work on a machine that's not turned on and not plugged up. It's, uh, they can't sneak in at night and turn your computer on. Um, but contact somebody to help you. So now, questions. I'll try my best, if you have any. <clears throat> how do we administer them? Uh, yeah, how do you go about like, testing that with all your employees? Like, sort of yeah, you can, uh, you can just type into a Google search phishing campaign. We do ours through, um, um, a soft, through Sophos. Um, so Sophos will give you a phishing campaign uh, module that you can um, send out. There's others, there's all kinds that you can buy online and if you have multiple employees and you want to <coughs> test everybody and even test yourself, you can do phishing campaigns and they're not crazy expensive. You might pay $30 a month for a, for a module to, or you might, you can find some for free where you could set up a phishing campaign for a certain number of users. You might have to type in all the email addresses, but um, if you have it set up on a domain, um, and you could send, <laughs> depends on. Yeah, just be careful. Yeah, yeah. Be careful about that. Yes, yeah, just tell him how to access it. Um, there's multiple. Yeah, just, just, yeah. Do, do your research on the company. Look for the, the best. And um, I have, like I said, we do ours through Sophos. Yeah. Yeah. I really do like Sophos. It's um, from a from an antivirus um, standpoint. It, it's it's been Endpoint is the name of the software. It's really good. I'm not familiar with that. How do you spell that? S O P H O S. Yeah. Yeah, you're welcome. And this is, October is National Cybersecurity Awareness Month. It, it is. is. Um, uh, Boyd Park to have a session today. Uh, we, but we also printed off some copies of some good information that uh, that's just put out. So I encourage you to take that with you. Thank you. 
there's more up here if, if those were all taken you can take them home a lot of the information we talked about is in these sheets um, as well because it's the same mantra it don't matter who you talk to everybody's going to tell you the same thing stop clicking stop reading and your emails <laughs> um, responding um, pay attention to the fact that um, they're out there and they will spare no no feelings because it don't cost them much to sit there in a cafe in some foreign African town where they're sitting there figuring out how to get to you and and you'll send them two hundred thousand dollars yeah I have, a, I have a question. This is not a business question. This is a personal Okay. Thing. Okay. Uh, on my uh, messenger, my Facebook messenger, I am forever getting all these friend reports. And these are people that I know, mm -hmm. but I would have no reason to get these repeated friend requests on them. So I just ignore them. Right. Um, is is that what I need to do, or do I just need to get off Facebook entirely? Okay. Well, that's one way. <laughs> but let me tell you this: you need to click decline. They don't get a they don't get a response. You need to click decline um, in Facebook. And the reason that you're going to click decline is that you don't want to befriend them. And they don't get a message that says, oh, your beloved friend said they don't like you and they don't want to be your friend. It doesn't tell them anything. They don't even know. And they will probably forget that they sent you the friend request in the first place. Because so many times people are just trying to build their numbers of friends. It's, a, it's one of the social sciences that, that, that says you, the more friends you have, the more friendly you are. And, and the sad reality is, is that's not true and it's causing a lot of emotional stress in our culture but click decline on them all and that will help so click cut the down to decline it is not allowing any kind of that no no just click decline now um, another thing that i will say about facebook though and i will urge you to do this on a regular basis you ought to change your password every 30 to 60 days Change your password. And don't use, I'm sorry? And remember it. And remember it, yes. Yes, you do need to remember it. You know, for you on your Facebook account, you could write it down in a book in your house and put it in your bed drawer. Nobody's going to sneak in there and, and hack you that way. But the truth of the matter is um, your password needs to be secure. It doesn't need to be the name of your dog or your cat. It doesn't need to be your favorite color. It doesn't need to be some commonly guessable word. It needs to be something strange. And one thing that I wanted to talk about when it comes to, to passwords, and I thought I had a slide in here about it, but I may have taken it out. One of the things that I wanted to talk about when it comes to passwords is make passwords that um, only, only make sense to you. So, like, um, if, if, if you want to use words, it's okay. But say, like, if you just say, like, Purple Dare got a hair, 2020, <laughs> okay? Or you want to say, if you want to say, uh, Five Kids on My Mind, 1971, exclamation, important capital, lowercase randomize that do do numbers at the beginning middle and or end or all three and then use a special character or two and the reason that you do that is is that it makes your password virtually uncrackable um, eight to twelve characters or more if it will allow it um, None of these three, you know, I love you, nothing, password with an at sign, all that stuff's got to go away. Snoopy Dog, 
um, things that you that are commonly known about you, your birth date, your your phone number, your dog and cat's name that you have posted all over Facebook anyway, and people people see that and then they think, well, that's probably their password. And guess what? If they're right, then they've got a hold of your your account, and then they start um, exploiting your friends, and then nobody wants to be your friend. <laughs> So, and it's not even your fault. So, yes. Hope that answers that. Did you have... How much 2FA do you guys have deployed internally? I'm sorry? How much 2FA do you guys have deployed for text versus app-based? Well, that's a good question. Not one that I can answer for you standing right here. Um, CJ, my network engineer, would have to, to talk to you about that. Yeah. Anybody else? Anything? Yeah, and that's that's one of the common common threads, especially when it comes to emails. If if you're getting any kind of offer, any kind of uh, great deal, throw it away. Nobody wants to make you richer. Nobody really wants to make you better. Make your computer faster. They don't care. No. You need to talk to your doctor about your health, your accountant about your money. You need to, you need to, you know, if you if you need some some help in other ways, talk to your psychiatrist. <laughs> but the reality is, is nobody online really cares <laughs> unless they can exploit you. All right. Thank y'all very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yes, good to be here. I don't think I want to turn on my computer. So anyway, uh, thank you for coming today. We really appreciate it. Our next uh, new knowledge workshop will be on October the 16th. It's going to be the top marketing strategies you should be using right now. So we hope that you'll come back in two weeks. Got any other questions? We appreciate you. We we'll look forward to having you meet. Have a great day. And if everyone could, uh, if you haven't signed in, you can sign in and then fill out your questionnaire. We would.